Next, we will welcome on stage uh, Ricardo Mendes, then Lee Morris Weitzer, and then Sami Arpa in this particular order. And then they will be later joined by Marjorie Pellon from France 24 Television for a Q&A session. So um, let's give a hand to Ricardo. Thank you. Hang on. Yes. Excellent. Hi, so as I mentioned, I'm Ricardo Mendes. I'm actually the technical director for Samsung Next in Europe, where we're doing venture investments in technology innovation. Not here to talk about the investment side of things, actually, but uh, I'll be happy to discuss that more during the breaks or after. Now, here is what I'm actually going to talk about. And we have about 15 minutes. We'll probably run over because we have a wide palette of things to go over. We're going to be talking about creativity, technology innovation, trains, large companies, hip hop mashups, and science fiction writers. And as we go, yes, yeah, a bit of a palette. But as we go over this, I'm also going to be going into some lessons that the software industry has learned that I think are useful to the media and other creative art, uh, arts as well. I'm a software engineer by training myself. But given all this stuff, let's start with one shoot at the beginning. Auguste and Louis Lumiere were technologists and innovators. They invented the cinematograph, but they had a multitude of movie, of movie patterns to their names, including the film perforations that survive to this day. And they were not just working on cinema. I mean, they invented color film technology and the color plate, which made color photography portable. And in 1895, they had a crazy productive year. In February, they patented the cinematograph, which we had been, they had been working on for a couple of years. In March 19, they started recording footage. By March 22nd, they were holding their first private showings. And by December, they had a paid public screening of 10 shorts. This is an iteration speed that most startups wish they could keep up. And on top of that, the traction, wow, like people hadn't ever seen anything like it. They just ate up anything the Lumiere's would put out. Now, in December of 1895, they put out the arrival of a train at the Chotat station, actually January of 1896. And I'm going to leave you, give you a minute to appreciate this. Now, the stories go that the projection was so realistic that people freaked out at the arrival of a train and ran out of the theater. And whether these are true or not is in dispute. This might just be apocryphal, but I'm sure that the Lumiere's benefited from stories that their projection was so realistic that people were, in, were getting scared about it. Because make no mistakes, uh, the Lumiere's understood not only technology, but marketing. Actually, earlier in 1895, they had had a hand on creating the world's first film poster. So they understood marketing, they understood technology, they invented an entire genre, and then they abandoned it. Just a few years later, they declared that cinema is an invention without any future because their audience were dwindling massively, and their audience were dwindling massively because they got tired of just looking at moving pictures. They were obviously hilariously wrong, right? We wouldn't be here otherwise. But they were so convinced of this that they even refused to license their inventions to others. And this leads us to the first issue that I want to discuss today, which is that when we think about innovation, we think that innovation is something that you know that what you're doing, you know what you're going for. But I believe that if you're truly innovating, you have no idea what you're doing. And I mean this in a good way, I swear. I think it's something you should embrace. And I know that given that we work with technology innovators, putting it this way might get me in trouble, but you have to think that if you're truly innovating, you're creating something for which there actually is no parallel out there. You have no idea what the potential of this thing is, and you have no idea what you or others are going to do with it. As William Gibson, science fiction writer, said, the street fight finds its uses for things. That's why it's really rare to find an innovator who can actually figure right away the implications of what they're creating. 
Because what's important is not the gadget. What's important is what you end up doing with it. And hold that thought for a moment, because we're going to get back to this quickly. Because I want to talk about creativity. Now, what the Lumias conceived with the cinematograph, they thought that it didn't have a future just because people got bored of looking at moving pictures. And this happened because their short were one-trick ponies. Now, unfortunately for them, they couldn't conceive a use beyond the one that they themselves were giving to the cinematograph. And it might be funny to describe the arrival of a train as realistic nowadays, because when we look at it, it's missing some obvious things that we would expect. I mean, maybe the most immediate one is sound, but that was merely a technical constraint. It's also missing some things that would have been possible with the technology of the time. It's missing, for instance, animation. It's missing editing. And these are all things that they could have done. Contrast instead with George Albert Smith's A Sin Through a Telescope. It came out just a few years later in, in the early 1900s, actually, in the, in the early 1900s specifically. And here we see some of the things that we could expect. Sure, it starts with a static camera, with a static shot like the Lumiere's do, like the Lumiere shot do. But then we get this, eventually. And this is two things that didn't exist before. First, this is a cut to a different scene. And second, it's a close-up. This is a different perspective from what we had before. And he's spending so long on it that it would make you think that he had the same thing about feet that Quentin Tarantino did, but uh, let's, let's give him a little bit. And eventually, there we go. Eventually, we go back and we see that what we were looking at was the character's perspective. So there's like three, four things that nobody had done before, all in the space of less of a minute here. And at the very end, we see that this was all set up for a bit of slapstick comedy on top of everything else. Now, arrival of a train is what in software terms we would call a technical demo effectively. It didn't really do anything with the technology. All it did was showcase its capabilities. But it was a direct one-to-one -one replacement of what had come before. Before you had static pictures, now you have moving pictures, which is where we get movies from. On the, on the other hand, a scene through a telescope is an application of technology to create something new. You could have done slapstick on a theater, obviously. I mean, theater and burlesque, opera were rife with it. But you couldn't have done this. You couldn't have cut through a different perspective. You couldn't have shown us exactly what a character was seeing, literally as seen through a telescope. And this, this application of technology to create something, to create a narrative form that just couldn't have existed before, this is what I'm really interested in. And therein lies the lesson that the software industry has learned, where the cemetery is full of startups which invented technology but didn't really capitalize on it. Innovation is about making something new. Creativity is about how you use this new thing that you have created. And if innovation isn't careful, creativity can eat it for breakfast. And this is important because I think that all too often we over-index on technology innovation and don't pay as much attention to the creative side of things. And I've been guilty of this myself. Uh, just a few months ago, we were at the Transylvanian Film Festival speaking at the Infinitive Summit, and after the, all the talks, the organizer asked every speaker the same question. What happens when film meets tech? And, you know, I stood there, heard some of the answers, like, hey, better distribution mechanisms, ease of payment, you know, reuse piracy, um, new narrative forms. I had suggested a few of those myself on the talk. But as I heard the answers, finally the penny dropped, and I realized that there was something that we were all ignoring, which is that film is a technology. Film is just a technology that we're already used to. And because we're used to, it's commonplace, it's plumbing. And one only thinks about plumbing when it fails. I mean, we're so used to film that unless you're this guy, you probably don't even bother with film anymore. It's all digital now, but we still call it film because it's, it's something that we're used to, and it's a direct one-to-one -one replacement. One-to-one -one replacements are something we like because they're easy to reason about. 
but I would argue that is not where the potential, where the interesting potential actually lies. Now, let me jump forward here a few years. Once upon a time, Microsoft was a tiny company. They made software for PCs, which were an insignificant percentage of the market and were expensive and definitely not commoditized. Now, Microsoft got huge. And it wasn't really technology innovation that made them. Because for a good couple decades there, Microsoft were followers, not leaders, even though they have improved massively since. And there's a lot we could say about their savage business practices their, during the 80s and 90s, but this only helped. This was also not what made Microsoft what it is now. What made Microsoft was a key realization of the founders, uh, of, the founders of the company, which was that they didn't really, they realized that it didn't matter what you could get from the current market share, from the current install base. What mattered was what percentage of new users and machines you could get. Now, Microsoft could just have decided to only build software for the extremely large mainframe market and decided that PCs would never amount to much. But if they had decided that, I doubt that they would have amounted to much themselves. Now, why is this important? Because I meet a lot of people who are working in film who think of their audiences as a direct one-to-one -one replacement of moviegoers. And get a mental image of moviegoers right now. It's a family going to a theater in a mall. Theaters, you know, even malls, are basically just those delivery mechanisms. They're a cathedral built back when people couldn't get access to the entertainment gospel anywhere else. The few people who got lucky enough to preach at these cathedrals, they knew who their audiences were. They knew where they're coming from. They knew what to give them. This is obviously not the future. And I know what you're thinking. Like, well, of course it's not, right? But neither might be Netflix. Netflix is just the now. There will be an influx of people coming in. They will come from places you don't expect and areas you would not have considered markets. You don't know these people. But I'm going to tell you something that is likely to help you when you encounter them and you have to deal with them. You need to think about them as users, not viewers. If movie theaters were cathedrals, Netflix is a television evangelist. And I think that the future is something different. I think the future is even a little bit weirder. The future is customized. The future is personal. The future is up to a point apocryphal. Because these new people coming in, they're going to want to interact with your creations. And the thing is, not all of them are going to agree with you. Some of them are going to think that your work will be better if it was edited differently, or if it had a different soundtrack, or if it was remixed with Jay-Z. And some will do something about it. And when they do, here's another lesson that the software industry has learned. Don't fight the users. You won't win. You just alienate them. What you need to do instead is become enablers. Help create a read-write future. Because this is a form of cre creativity. And those of us here, those who write or film or compose or build things, we don't have a monopoly on creativity. There's an army of people out there hoping to take your creations and platform and build something with them. Maybe they wouldn't come up with your ideas in the first place. Maybe they wouldn't have laid the foundations themselves. But they can help take your work and bring it further. And it isn't until now that we have technology that can help enforce content profit sharing, for instance. You get to build into this platform, so you get to create new ones and help create an in, a more interesting future, because there are some fundamental changes happening. And you can see this on how remixing has helped and create entire new careers, like with Danger Mouse, who became known when he created, when he released the Grey Album, where in which, who has heard the Grey Album? Actually, I'm curious. Nobody. Interesting. This was, I think, 2006. It's basically a remix of an a cappella version of Jay-Z's The Black Album with the Beatles' White Album. And it's, it's a fascinating construct, and it actually helped introduce audiences of both, of both artists to the other. And this can also help create, can help me make feel fresh things that felt stale even when they came out. Like when this 
user who goes by the name of Only Yoda Forgives took the three Star Wars prequels, re-edited them into a 90-minute movie, into a single 90-minute movie, and added a new soundtrack uh, to kind of give it the same feeling as the, as the movie Drive, in case you're fam familiar with it. Or it can also bring forward something weird and interesting, like when Two Melo decided to mix uh, Jay-Z with Chrono Trigger. And he created an epic that mixes Jay-Z's lyrics with new narration and game music. And it's something completely new. And then he followed it up with a sequel that mixes Nas and Castlevania and has a continuation of the plot of the original. With this in mind, I would advise you, if you're creating something, to consider the Creative Commons. Now, I don't have enough time to go into them, but I would recommend that you watch Lawrence Lessig's sensational TED talk, 11 Laws That Choke Creativity, which is actually about 11 years old by now. Now, if you're wondering about the effects of Creative Commons, I would recommend that you check out Blindsight. It's a sensational, fantastic book, science fiction book, dense with ideas that has become extremely influential with both scientists and science fiction authors since it came out. It was released under Creative Commons, and the thing is, chances are that if he hadn't released it under Creative Commons, I wouldn't be here talking about it. Because Peter Watts himself credits releasing the book under that license with rescuing his career from obscurity. And of course, the inevitable question is, well, what, what if I do and they copy my stuff? Guess what? Piracy has remained at above 90% since the 1970s, at least on software. All the DRM in the world hasn't really helped. What if they copy your stuff? They're going to. Someone will. And you might as well have a say on how it happens. Because we need to enable convenience. Make sure that it's people to come to you. You know, as far as entertainment goes, we live in a post-scarcity era. There's more content out there than anyone could consume. I'm happy to pay co for content myself, for instance, but if it make, doesn't make it difficult for me, if it doesn't take my card, if it DRM stops me from playing it on the device that I want, if it doesn't have subtitles, I'm not gonna bother. I'm gonna find another avenue. And I'm one of those few people who are technology savvy and willing to give it multiple tries. And if you're still doubtful about Creative Commons, I would advise you to read what Cody Doctorow wrote. He's, an author, he's a very well-known science fiction author, and he releases his books under Creative Commons as well. And the way that he put it is that for any creator, obscurity is a much bigger danger than, than piracy. Now, Creative Commons and the remix culture are part of a larger pattern. And by examining it, we can go into the final lesson that I want to bring out today. This pattern is something that was obvious in the 19th century, when the Lumias innovated, but then myopically decided that their invention wasn't going to lead anywhere and refused to license their content to others. This lesson is something that can be transformative. As we can see in the case of Microsoft, whose one CEO called open source a cancer, and Microsoft has now transformed itself into a very profitable open source company. And it's also a lesson that's very expensive to forget. Just ask IBM, who was once an unstoppable behemoth and recently had to acquire Red Hat for $33 billion in cash or pretty much a full third of IBM's whole net value. Here's that lesson. And if you remember nothing else about this talk, remember this. If there's one thing that the software industry has learned over and over again, is that there is always a bad idea to bet against openness. If you will, if you will allow me to stretch a bit the analogy, keep this in mind, because I think that every technology era is the arrival of a train. And we have a massive one pulling in right now with 5G, with decentralization, with the switch to mobile, with everybody here carrying supercomputers in, this, in their pockets. I can tell you where this is going. I have no idea. But I can tell you that it's likely to be 
full with users and creators, people willing to take your content and bring it further, and on top of that, to pay for the privilege. Are you getting on board? Or are you staying behind the station, hoping to capitalize on the dwindling base of, pe of you people who are just happy to be consumers? Thank you. Are you in questions, or do you just get off? Uh, we'll do the questions later. Okay. Thank you. And Timur, um, it's your turn now. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Limor Schweitzer, and I'm a um, founder, CEO of a company called Move AI that develops uh, software for autonomous uh, robots. And I want to give you some perspective and little bits and pieces of data about the robotics market and how that uh, potentially has, uh, will have an effect on the creative media. Um, when we think of robots, Traditionally, we, we think about the automotive industry or the, the robotic arms. Um, so the robotic arms market has evolved the past uh, 35 years around the car industry. It's a symbiotic entity with the car industry. You wouldn't be able to produce 300,000 cars in three months without um, robotic arms and, and other forms of automation. Um, the food production today is completely automated. You can have six people in, in a farm producing two million eggs. That would not be possible without this kind of uh, automation. So we already rely on this. We are, it's part of the background. We don't really know it, or most people don't understand it. But it's there. It's already being deployed everywhere, these robots. Um, you may have seen these videos from, from Amazon warehouse where um, people pick that there is what's called the picker or you, you order something on Amazon one TV pair of underwear and uh, chewing gum and magically that appears within a few hours that magic is is done thanks to robotic automation these robots that carry the shelves around the facility and bring them to the picker and allow um, Amazon to deal with 400 million SKUs, 400 million different types of items, and, and be able to fulfill orders. They want to get to 30 minutes in metropolitan areas. But there is a new kind of automation that is not just for the big guys, that is now coming and will be is making this kind of automation more accessible to everybody else, to small operations. Here we can see a, a little Chinese factory, and this is a a combination of a robotic arm and a little autonomous vehicle. Um, total cost of this system is about $25,000. And it's, um, it just drives around and brings stuff from one production line to another. Here up there we can see Starship, which is a, a delivery robot that brings your pizza home. Um, this is a hotel delivery that does uh, room service. So these are new kinds of robotic um, systems. This is something that, that we develop. It's, it's uh, a robot that works in logistics facilities and works among people and replaces people in uh, moving carts around the facility and collaborating with robotic arms and with people. So the new era of robotic is really about collaboration between people and robots. And the, the key is that the cost is being driven down to a level that anybody can afford it. Um, we, we developed, actually, this is me in Lederhosen. Um, it's a robotic uh, cameraman. So we can do repeat um, shots for, uh, rather than with a flying drone, but with like a ground drone. Uh, same technology used in, in cinematography. So the, the key um, uh, tricks uh, that, that are now accessible to everybody is what's called the, the collaborative robot arm which now is at around 10,000 euros. You can get access to this technology, which used to be 300,000 euros, 500,000 euros for the car industry. Now it's 10,000, and it's even going down further to, to even 6,000. And what you can do with these robotic arms is more and more. Still, it is 
an extension of, of industrial applications like polishing and assembly, but you see it more and more in other novel applications like kitchen, uh, food production, um, different um, applications in, in, for hobby and, and engineering. Um, this was a recent Kickstarter campaign. A Chinese company just broke the, the barrier of $1,000 per joint in, in robotic arm. This is re insanely revolutionizing the, uh, potentially the acceptance of this technology in everyday use. Um, so this is the other type of, co the other component which is now being democratized. These are autonomous vehicles. We hear about self-driving cars. So this is exactly the same technology, only it's used for typically indoor application or campus application of delivering stuff from one place to another. You don't need people anymore to move carts, to shift things around. It's now 15,000, 10,000. The Chinese will bring it down further and it can work among people. Other things that are helping this evolution is actually coming, the technology coming from the mobile world. So augmented reality, in order to allow you to see things that are not there through the spectacles of the mobile phone, uh, it's called uh, 3D tracking or video, 3D from video tracking. And that technology, uh, coincidentally, is essential for uh, robots to understand where they are in relation to space. And so this technology is being democratized through uh, mobile phones and the uh, extension of the mobile world. The, the paradigm of the iPhone X with a zillion pixels per square inch, that is kind of seen as a dying breed. Uh, you can't get away with charging so much money for uh, pixel density. And the next layer in, in, in this entertainment form is going to be some kind of augmented reality. And 5G is basically the highlight of 5G is 4K um, uh, screening to each individual in a metropolitan area. So nobody knows what's, who needs that kind of stuff. Why do I need 4K to the mobile handset? But one idea is that with augmented reality, we can actually start seeing the world in a different way. We annotate, the computer will annotate. We will look at people, it will tell me who they are, what's my relationship to them. I will look around, I, when I walk around, I will see things and I'll know where I can buy them, how much they cost in comparison shopping, in, all in live in real time, um, and, and new forms of social interaction. Uh, another thing that is coming from, again, from mobile world consumer, uh, electronics is is the neural networks or what everybody calls now our, our AI. Um, so AI, as people call it, is 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 uh, one class of algorithm called neural networks. It's been around for 30 years. It's just that now there is so much computation power that it's accessible to anybody. It's now a commodity. You, if you've got a thousand pictures of cats and dogs. It will take you about an hour to watch through a video of how to classify these cats and dogs, and then you've got a cat-dog classifier. And so it's now this super accessible technology that, um, that everybody now uses, um, and it's going to be part of this experience of augmented reality where everything is annotated. You see stuff, and it gives you, if you remember, Fight Club, the first scene. Um, now, about education and robotics. So we're, we're entering in this world, into this new era where this kind of technology of uh, collaborative robot arms, autonomous vehicles, autonomous logistics, it's part of our everyday life. And so I often get asked, the question is, what should kids learn now in order to be ready for this world? So robotics, um, there's actually, this is a, there is an open source software framework called ROS, and it's super accessible, but it's so far removed from the education system. This is like science fiction. It's not even studied in, in colleges or in higher education. Um, it's really currently a niche, a, a growing niche, but, but a niche. And, and this is uh, the direction where education should be heading. So in the past 20 years, the European Union has contributed well over, I don't know, 30 billion euros towards uh, research or um, collaboration between universities and, and uh, uh, research and, and private sector uh, through what's called now Horizon 2020, before it was uh, FP7, FP6. And so that has led a lot of research towards robotics. And all the bulk of that 
billions of euros in robotics are in this thing called ROS, and it's now accessible, and everybody can use it and learn about this new technology. Um, also, the reason why so much research has been done there is because computer science is actually a dying breed. Nobody does a PhD in computer science anymore. Um, there's been an M&A going on in the UK between computer science department and psychology. It's become like this fluffy, amorphic thing, um, whereas in Germany it's much more rigorous and, and technical. Um, it's just become kind of complicated to do these robotic things, and so it's been left behind. Other things that are happening in Europe in robotics, so if you may have heard of Industry 4.0, that was a, a German very clever manifesto, a bit like uh, the original uh, Bitcoin manifesto that was very clever and then misinterpreted. So the, uh, Germany's Industry 4.0 was manifesto saying, hey, you know, this is really going the wrong way, China is producing everything, we're going to be left with nothing and totally dependent on the Chinese. Let's try and strive to automate as much as possible, remove humans from cheap labor and, and repetitive tasks and anything that has to do with, with uh, physical labor, and instead create this kind of ecosystem of automation and refinement of how to remove people from anything industrial. Um, so that this uh, cartel mafia of the car industry in Europe, we, we cannot keep it up there forever. Eventually, the Chinese cars will come in and kill the thing. So nobody really understood Industry 4.0. There's a lot of conferences and, and things around Industry 4.0, but nothing really has been done about it. But the Chinese have really taken it seriously, and they launched a program called Made in China 2025. They allocated $230 billion, and in the last year, uh, over 200,000 robotic arms were introduced into replacing labor in China. Um, yeah, so China is now the leading country in robotics. So if you think of China production as, you know, cheap labor, uh, uh, you know, people earning four dollars a day, that's a thing of the past. It's now the leading automation country. And Germany is lagging behind. I'm not talking about any other European country. Um, but there is hope. I mean, the, this new robotic world is, is deemed to be um, growing at an exponential rate right now, this new kind of robotic automation. So there is still a lot of room to grow, and there is uh, uh, hope in, and, uh, for, for future of uh, a European uh, ecosystem with more automation, with more production, with actually, if you remove the, the cost of labor from the equation and introduce more automation, not only can you deal with scale, but it also creates a playing field. All that matters is that if your supply chain is there, if you can bring in the raw materials and everything, then it doesn't matter if it's produced in Shenzhen or it's produced in Germany. Um, that's the key. But um, uh, we, there is not enough depth of understanding of that in order to, to facilitate that ecosystem. And so we are still and going to be reliant on, on China and Asia. Um, and this brings to the last point, which is the future of labor. Uh, this was the, the original um, McKinsey study. There have been several since saying that they, they looked at the US census of labor and, and try to analyze uh, how each type of labor, whether it is a doctor, a farmer, or a politician, what do they do in everyday work and tasks? And so they then created different task categories, like managing people or uh, physical labor in an undeterministic environment. And then they realized, they came to a realization that 50% of the tasks on average across all sectors of labor can be replaced by automation with today's technology and therefore inevitably will be replaced. 50% of what we do today in what we call our job can and will be replaced by automation within the next 10 years. Um, so this is serious stuff. And um, yeah, so we are building um, a kind of an operating system for these logistics robots to orchestrate hundreds of robots in production and displace people from labor, uh, letting them play tennis instead. Um, watch movies, consume me legal media on Netflix. <laughs> um, and that's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And Sami, waiting for you now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. So I will talk about shorts. Before moving to shorts, let's look at the feature films. So here in this graph, you see the change of average length of feature films over the years. So around 30s, we, were, we are talking about 90 minutes of films in average. This peaks like almost like two hours in 60s and then 2000, almost 130 minutes. Now it starts to decrease again slowly. But the question now, in 30s, the movies is one of the most important entertainment channel. Today, we have many other entertainment channels for people. Is it still possible to fit such long content into people's daily life? So, if we look at the movie theaters, the answer is no, uh, because we see the decline in movie theaters and they try to make it more interesting, like 3D, 4D, 5D, even 7D, making the seats comfortable, even more comfortable, even in the form of the beds. You can really sleep inside the movie theater, and some movie theaters are serving dinner. But the thing, so today we have another form of entertainment. So yes, in the past we were looking at the big screens, but if you look at the general consumption, now people are consuming the content in much smaller screens in mobile. And, and the thing, everything is fast. If, can we fit a two hours of film into a mobile phone? If we do that, probably we will miss the next stop, which is 10 minutes away, because the trains are very fast as well. So, but what do we watch on the mobile? So yeah, mostly YouTube, practical information, how to peel a pineapple, pomegranate, which is quite challenging. Or YouTubers. It's a very strong entertainment channel today with the pranks, vlogs. But for us, the question now, can we fit some cinematographic content to that kind of consumption and short films? short content, uh, cinematographic form. So we have analyzed, uh, yeah, just this point before. So we have like 1.5 billion people watch 45 minutes of uh, video consumption on smartphone every day. So that's really a gigantic amount of content consumption. But so they don't watch short films, they watch YouTube videos in general. What amount of people actually watch short films right now? We found that 6%, uh, this is like 6.5 in US, 5.5 in Switzerland, and also the rest of Europe is around 6%, uh, which is not too big, but it's also not too small. If you look at this in more detail, 6% uh, watch short films more than once a week. And then there's another 13% watch short films more than once a month. So the rest of 81%, half of them, they, are not, they don't even know what a short film is. And the other half, they find short films quite boring. So that's, yeah, that's a bit interesting, but actually it is logical because if you look at the way the public uh, get introduced with short films, it's the film festivals. And if you go to major film festivals, there's only specific type of short films. They are, in general, really art house experimental shorts, which is not interesting for the, actually, uh, majority of the public, and that's, that's their impression of short films. But indeed, there are any type of short films for mainstream audience, for art house people, any type, every year, like, a few thousands of short films are produced. So if you look at the markets, so this 6 and 13 percent, which makes 19 percent of people who are already interested in short films, and if you consider like 500 million total uh, viewership, this makes like 95 million people around the world. 
And with a flat subscription kind of program, it makes like a $6.5 billion yearly market, which is huge, actually. So what about short films? What is the story about that? So there's like thousands of them are produced every year, I mentioned. So we have discovered that uh, more than 70% of them become uh, invisible after the festival cycle. You cannot access them online. Uh, we assessed some analytics for that. We have also our own film festival, some small festival in Switzerland. So we evaluated closely the submissions to our festival for like 3,000 submissions. We normalized the jury ratings. We saw actually many films got quite uh, high jury ratings after the normalization, like 600 out of 3,000. This is very high. And once we check their distribution story, the ones get uh, bad jury rating, in general, they go to Vimeo and YouTube as free because they don't have expectation of commercialization, even, the, even in the future. And just a few of uh, good ones, really good ones, can find place in the big platforms, but this is really tiny if they have really big awards, like Oscar, uh, winner. Uh, but then, like majority of these red area, the majority of the good quality ones, they really stay invisible. For us, this was the, this was the opportunity. Uh, so that's why we created Sofi TV, uh, video on demand platform exclusively for short content. So for the limit for us was like 40 minutes, but if you look at the average in general, short films are around 10 to 15 minutes. But still, there's one challenge. Once you go to Netflix, you already have a bit of idea what you can watch, because you have heard most of titles already in advance. That's not the case for short films. Once you go to such a platform, you don't know what to watch. You have like many, many of the films. So it's, all, it's important to engage the users in correct way. That's why uh, we put a lot of effort in AI parts. The problem with AI in creative industry is not like detecting cat and dog. So this is not like black and white. There's many gray areas. For example, we were trying to understand emotions over the films. So this took us quite a long time, but finally we really got very nice results. And then we can now detect how emotions, genres are changing over the film. This is a very valuable data. We call this like a film recipe. Okay, we know what are the ingredients of a specific film. Same way we can also understand what kind of ingredients the user like. It's not like a user only likes drama, but it can be like 30% drama, 50% comedy, and a bit of thriller. So just a bit our model. So we try to make this bigger together with filmmakers. We have a like revenue share model directly half goes to the filmmakers. And our growth plan, we want to have 2 million subscribers by 2023. So our team. So I put this on purpose because we have a strong team of scientists and people from film industry. I think the interdisciplinary work uh, at this age is quite important, also in, also in film industry. So our scientists are bringing AI to the uh, to the industry as like uh, to our company as like uh, next generation storytelling. Uh, a bit our roadmap, so we have launched like six months ago. Already we got some nice traction. Uh, a lot of filmmakers, they are quite interested in that because that's the really pain for them. In general, most of VOD platforms, they try to make money from the filmmakers, not from the audience. You put a lot, you put a lot of effort to make the film, eventually you have to pay still money to get your film distributed. We try to reverse this. So just one last slide to conclude. On the other side of Atlantic, I mean, they are aware of such opportunity as well. And recently, Jeffrey uh, Kessenberg uh, raised $1 million just for another short form uh, video content uh, venture. And we shouldn't miss the train at this side of Atlantic as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we have time for a small moderated Q&A. So, Marjorie, Payon, Sami, uh, Ricardo, Limor, please.
Okay, so actually time flies by on this stage this morning, so it's going to be a super quick Q&A with you guys. But um, speaking of taking the train or actually getting into the train of innovation, my question is just about convergence. Okay, so when, for instance, Limor is talking about um, robots and smart robots, I'm, seeing, I'm just uh, seeing there are great new opportunities for uh, filming uh, to have cost reduced, to be more efficient. When we're talking about AI, for instance, or AR, I'm seeing they're a super cool um, tool for new algorithms to be even more focused on what we're actually looking for when we're looking for a very specific segment in a movie. When you're talking about shorts, for instance, as Sami, I'm just saying, yeah, shorts have been made available just because of this. So, again, convergence. Can we actually achieve it? It's been achieved like for okay, like the past uh, two seasons in the US and in China. Be, so where are we guys? Yeah. How can Europe catch oh, up actually right. with this yeah, convergence? They did, no, they did backwards. backwards. Yeah. Sure. I, perhaps catching up is the wrong idea. Perhaps we should be trying to do something that is not quite what they're doing, for instance, uh, if you were to try to catch up with Google and data connection, you collection, you probably couldn't. But why would you want to? I mean, that type of thing is completely noxious. Um, do you want to really create Europe into some sort of manufacturing powerhouse like China? Do you want to chase that when you're already 10 something years behind the curve? Maybe Europe needs to find its own niche instead of uh, trying to just catch up to what other platforms or countries are doing. Uh, I mean, I can talk about this from perspective of right. shorts. I mean, once we look at actually Europe in terms of production of shorts, uh, one step further in, uh, from mm -hmm. US, in my opinion. But once it comes to the branding, PR, mm -hmm. marketing of this, that's, that's the, I think, uh, where we are weaker. So for us as well, as well are in our own journey, so that's the, we have the really innovation, really strong uh, support uh, for innovative startups plus uh, research development, even US companies, I, I talk about specifically in Switzerland, they come to open research centers in Switzerland. But once it comes to branding PR of this, I mean, that's the main struggle. Actually, many, many European startups move to US at this point because they cannot find the enough maybe know-how also support at this regard. Which is definitely a question when it comes to the war for and the search for talents. But we have one answer with thinking out of the box basically and trying to uh, come up with better ideas and innovation. We have one uh, also solution when it comes to ser better storytelling uh, our own innovations and short movies. Limor, um, what is actually uh, your take on this? Like for instance, again, when you're talking about smart robotics, it could be a super huge opportunity for the filming techniques to reduce cost and to be more efficient. So how can we all actually, because the digital transformation, of course, disrupts every single industry, every single sector, so including the creative industries per se. So how can we make the most of it and think out of the box and create our own tools for innovation? The uh, innovation in robotics, well, one thing is, uh, is technical tools. So the drone was introduced, I don't know, eight years ago. It was a, a very niche hobby thing, and, and overnight it, it became a, a very useful thing. And then DJI, Chinese company, took over 100% of the market, uh, game over. For, and but it did um, what it did do is it commoditized the camera in the air, which before that required a helicopter. Um, now the same thing can happen now with uh, commoditizing a, a, a ground drone form, so a single cameraman or even no cameraman is needed in order to create beautiful shots. Um, that's on the technical side. And on the creative side, the fact that you, you can have access to these new forms of automation uh, tools, the, the autonomous vehicle and the robotic arms and whatever comes on top, I think uh, is an opportunity um, 
as with the, the train uh, anecdote. Uh, it's something that right now is used for a very particular use case, but um, if you throw it out there and it's $6,000, and so maybe people can come up with interesting ideas. Which definitely brings us back to the question of education and the, again, search for talents in this industry. Will, in the near future, filmmakers uh, be compelled to all be software engineers or AI engineers at the same time? Do we have to mix and match innovation and make it blend so seamlessly in our work when it comes to the creative industries that we need to actually be engineers ourselves? Maybe... Who was it who said that software, was it, you, it was you, right, who said the software engineering is pretty much disappearing or that nobody gets a PhD in software engineering anymore? I expect software engineering is going to recede into the background, quite frankly. It is just going to become plumbing like so many other things have. Um, if anything, if I can go back to the original, and since we have people here from the European, from the European Commission, Europe do, does a lot of things right. Uh, one of the things that it doesn't necessarily do right is that there's a key barrier to innovation, which is that it, there, there's a lot of guardrails that disincentivize people from taking risks. Uh, for instance, I'm based in Germany, and something that happens with German entrepreneurs or with German developers, not necessarily the company founders, is that they're not really incentivized to go beyond what they normally would when working at a company because they can't get actual equity. They can just get phantom equity, otherwise they're tax liable. And this is an extremely powerful incentive. When people actually feel that they own what they're working on, this is, an, this is a very powerful incentive for people to actually uh, you know, go beyond what the eight to five or something. And when you're innovating, you can't just take innovation as an, as an eight to five thing. So sorry that I kind of co-opted things to get back to that. Actually, one thing I've learned here in Estonia is that disruption does not ask permission. So I guess it's basically a bottom line here when it comes to innovating as Europeans. Do not ask for permission, even though regulation needs to be, you know, sorted out at some point. Um, very last word, because again, time is definitely flying by here uh, at uh, Kulturi Katel. Uh, Limor, Sami, do you want to add one more thing? I just want to add this, your last question. I mean, I, I am actually a computer scientist, but, scientist, but also a uh, filmmaker. So I see the, the style of communication from the both sides. So the main problem for me is the way of communication. It's really s different languages sometimes. So I think we should have more interdisciplinary programs to develop this common language. This is one of the barriers, uh, in my opinion. Very good thoughts. Limor, final word with you. Um, well, I think uh, in terms of uh, regulation, I think that the lack thereof is the best thing possible, um, uh, especially in a, in a, uh, when it comes to new markets or creativity. I, I'm, I'm all about laissez-faire and to let people die happily, you know, doing stuff and then create regulations once there is enough dead people. Like, uh, aviation industry wouldn't exist uh, if you look at the aviation industry from the 50s, there were like, uh, like thousands of experiments that failed. And thanks to them, we, we benefit today from, from free flights anywhere in the world. <laughs> well, I guess it's, you know, <laughs> fold seven times and rise, raise eight or something. Uh, Sten, I'll leave you the mic to you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much.